I branded this, by the way, uh, FIPR, which is the Foundation for Information Policy Research, uh, of which I'm treasurer, uh, which will turn up later in the story. I'm going to talk to you about Form, uh, a moderately famous company at the moment. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the Great Firewall of China, about peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file sharing, the Internet Watch Foundation, uh, and uh, towards the end, the Interception Modernization Program which is a wonderful new invention uh, by some people out in Cheltenham uh, as to uh, how to change the world. Now, first of all, let's talk a bit about what we mean by behavioral advertising. Now, advertising generally is very big business. It's what we advertisers will tell you. It's what's paying for the Internet. Uh, and uh, the basic Google model, and Google is taking in a very large percentage of all this money, is that they just put ads on relevant pages. But the alternative approach is that you show adverts which are relevant to the people who happen to visit a particular page. Uh, so the ads on relevant pages is very much what we do with magazines, in that if you buy a car mag, you'll find that it's full of adverts for cars. Uh, and if you happen to uh, glance through your partner's copy of Vogue or something like that, you'll find that there are very few car ads in there. But the idea of behavioral advertising is that uh, uh, the advertiser will remember that you're interested in cars and will show you car ads even though you're flicking through Vogue. Which if you're flicking through Vogue for the underwear ads will be a bit of a disappointment to you. We've seen this uh, on the internet for over 10 years, double click, very much a 90s sort of firm. Uh, it tracked your visits to participating sites on the basis that cookies were returned, in every case to uh, double click because bits of a car uh, website were in fact owned by DoubleClick and therefore the cookie was returnable to DoubleClick and not to the people who were running the website. Uh, and what uh, the company Form proposed to do was to improve on this model uh, by inspecting all of the HTML pages, all of the web pages which were flowing back and forth to your machine as you browse the web. Form would then deduce the nature of the content of those pages uh, and then if you visited a participating site uh, which was hosting adverts which uh, Form uh, was uh, selecting for them, then you would see relevant ads when you got, you'd see car ads when you got to another website. And Form was able to do this in a way which had a great deal of anonymity connected with it because basically advertisers don't actually care who you are. What they actually care is what you're interested in and they break you down for simplicity into categories. And it used to be advertisers took a very simple way of, uh, of this and they, they had ABC ones and sort of D's and E's and this sort of thing. Uh, and nowadays they have much more fancy names. They try and uh, some of the top advertising agencies will split you down into about 50 categories with fancy names like empty nesters and that sort of thing, depending on what uh, they think that how they've broken you down into a category. And then uh, they try and serve ads which are appropriate uh, to that particular category. So basically advertisers can live with the anonymity uh, and therefore form thought they were onto a winner. And this is the basic uh, design of the form system. You're sitting there at your computer. All your traffic is going through a layer 7 switch, which does most of the magic, out through the internet, and you're going to visit cnn.com. I've chosen cnn.com, not entirely at random, it just leads to very short URLs, which are much easier to fit on the slide. Mm -hmm. So the magic in the layer 7 switch manages to assign you a unique identifier, which is about 16 bytes long, so there's you know, plenty of uh, space. Uh, to identify everybody uniquely. Uh, and then when a page comes back from CNN, a copy of it is sent along with your identifier so that we know who, who was reading this particular web page, and it's fed off to a profiler, uh, and the profiler crunches through the page, decides what this page is all about, and hence what you might be interested in, passes the data through a firewall uh, off to something called a channel server. And the channel server makes a note uh, and keeps that note for several months in terms of your unique identifier and the sort of thing that you're interested in. And then when you go off and you visit a participating website which uh, has adverts, spaces, blank white spaces which will contain adverts, uh, then uh, you get the particular page from uh, the website and you go off and you ask the profiler for the advert to go into the white space and that uh, request includes your unique identifier. And therefore, the profiler can have a quick chat with the channel server as to which advert should be shown to you, and you will get a suitable ad served up to you. 
So that's how form works. Under the hood, what it's doing is it's taking pages and it's breaking them down into word tokens and it's making a list of those word tokens, putting them in a order of frequency and then taking the top 10 from that list. This is kind of natural language processing 101. It's the sort of thing that search engines did before Google came along and showed a much better way of doing it. So I'm not terribly impressed by this as a way of working out what a page is about, but they seem very happy with it, so it's their system after all. Uh, these pages, by the way, are one of Forms' web pages uh, about a year ago. One of people called 8020 Thinking, who gave them a clean bill of health on the data protection side, uh, and one of my pages uh, written about this. Uh, and you can probably see from sort of the emphasis on words like attack and so so forth, uh, which might be my page. Now the channel server is also told about URLs, and URLs contain search terms, uh, for because that's the way Google and various people work, uh, and this information is passed to the channel server as well. The channel server doesn't know your IP address, and therefore technically it doesn't know who you are, uh, and therefore you get all sorts of nice anonymity properties. So the sort of thing that, that you, you buy, if you go and buy one of these white spaces off uh, form, is you say, I would like to show this ad to people who visited three or more travel sites in the last two weeks, that sort of thing. Uh, and then form will produce you a, a string of people who have that property, at which point your advert for a hotel or uh, a week in the Canaries or whatever uh, will go to the right people. You will get more visitors for your uh, for your advertising spend and therefore you'll be happy and you'll give form more and more money and they'll become bigger than Google and take over the world. Completely under the hood, there's some really exotic things going on because form is trying really hard to arrange to uh, forge cookies so that when you go visit CNN.com, the pages uh, go back and forth to CNN, including a cookie from CNN with your unique identifier in there. So of course CNN won't play ball with this by putting the cookie on, by uh, having that sort of cookie. So uh, form has to actually fake this cookie. Uh, and that's what this lot is about. And time is short, so I'm going to skip over this. But it's riveting stuff, and uh, you wouldn't believe it. If you don't like form, and many people do not, they feel that having people work out what you're interested in at in this level is in some sense wicked, uh, then you can opt out. And you can opt out by going and getting a particular cookie value set within the webwise.net domain, which it belongs to form. So they'll see this cookie and conclude that you want to opt out. Or if you never return any cookies at all, you'll also opt out. But if you delete all your cookies, which is what some people recommend you do, you know, at the end of your browsing session, delete all your cookies and everybody forgets about you, uh, then with the form system, it doesn't know that you've opted out because the opt out is actually in the cookie, and therefore you have to go through that wonderful dance of the cookies next time you visit, every time you visit websites thereafter, which is uh, quite a lot backwards and forwards. Uh, and also, if you do what people uh, often do in order to get rid of double click, which is to set in your host file doubleclick.net to resolve to 127001. Uh, that's really bad news with this system because, in fact, the way that dance of the cookies works, uh, you end up uh, never actually going anywhere at all. And you will sit there failing to visit any websites at all. Uh, and the form system is supposed to uh, spot the fact that you're not actually making any progress and turn itself off automatically. Whether or not that works, I couldn't say. I've never been a allowed to actually play with a real live running form system. Uh, the ISPs who uh, thought they wanted to deploy the form system uh, before they realized what a fuss it was causing started looking at network level opt-outs as a way in which you would actually say to your ISP, I really don't want my traffic going through this system at all, and I don't like all of this opt-out cookies, uh, and the ISP will say that's all right, we'll arrange that you're on a special block of IP addresses uh, and we will not uh, send all of your traffic through the form system. Uh, and it is uh, certainly hinted to me uh, that this is one of the things that killed off form being deployed at BT uh, was in fact the difficulty of getting that system to actually work properly. This brings one to the, really the, the big debate uh, about the form system, which is whether or not the system should be opt-in or opt-out. Uh, the system is potentially processing sensitive personal data. Uh, that's my final example there. Union advice for vicars living with AIDS. Uh, that manages to hit all of uh, your religion, uh, your trade union membership, and medical information. Uh, and therefore, that's extremely sensitive, and therefore, it's specially protected under the Data Protection Act uh, 1998. Uh, and an informed opt-in is required in order to process that data. And if you had a web page like that, of course, 
uh, then you might expect words like vicar, aids, and that sort of thing to come in the top ten list of uh, popular words on that page, and therefore form would actually be processing this data. Uh, and the Information Commissioner took the view that the <coughs> Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations, which are uh, an enactment in the UK of an EU directive on privacy, was that an opt-in was required. Uh, BT form and various people uh, beg to differ on this, uh, and one must assume that if they ever rolled out a system which did not have an opt-in, then the Information Commissioner, commissioner would be rushing along and gumming them to death in the way in which he, he uh, looks after <coughs> us all uh, in all of these areas in this effective manner. Now, what uh, Foundation for Information Policy Research's uh, uh, tame lawyer uh, pointed out, uh, which was rather inconvenient for all concerned, was that this is in fact wiretapping. And if you actually look at the definitions in the Regulation Investigative Powers Act 2000, you find that since 2000, in order to do wiretapping legally, you have to have permission from both ends of a connection. Right? This is in fact so built in that there has to be a special rule for the police if uh, there's a kidnap, because if there's a kidnap, uh, the family, of course, will give you permission to listen into the phone conversation, but the kidnappers haven't give them, given permission. And therefore, it would be wiretapping, and therefore, you'd have to go to the uh, Home Secretary in order to get a warrant in order to do it. However, there is a special provision which says uh, that if you have a Part 2 authorization as well, then you can listen in in this special case. So that's all right. Um, but of course, Form doesn't have Part 2 permissions in order to uh, listen in to kidnap victims. So basically, uh, there's a big problem legally with uh, the form system, which is that, that it is wiretapping uh, and that they don't have permission from the, uh, the, the web end of the connect connection. They may or may not have permission uh, opt-in or opt-out from the person uh, at the ISP, but they don't have permission from the other end. Uh, and it is kind of remains up in the air uh, in that uh, various people have tried to get the police to prosecute VT for, de for deploying form because they actually tested this a few times and they didn't actually tell anybody at all that they were even testing it, so they clearly didn't even have opt-in permission. Uh, and currently uh, the status of that is that the CPS are reviewing the City of London's uh, police's uh, reason for rejecting the prosecution and they've been reviewing that for some considerable time and are probably hoping the whole thing will go away. Meantime, the ISPs who did say that they were going to uh, work with form have decided they're not going to work with form. Uh, and uh, form share price is currently looking very ill indeed. So they may have some difficulty raising money in the future, who's to say? So one of the lessons out of the, the form debacle is that there's a difference between privacy and data protection. Data protection is this fantastic idea from the 70s about how uh, some rules and regulations were going to protect us all from mainframes and the sort of processing which people did in the 1970s on mainframes. And we've got a kind of absolutely minimal watered-down variant of those rules uh, deployed in the UK. Uh, and the first approximation under data protection, if you, ana if you anonymize things, then you have achieved data protection. But privacy is subtly different, because privacy is to do with whether or not you care about the information which is being disclosed about uh, by you. And I would claim, and I'm a little bit extreme on this perhaps, is that even if the person doesn't know who you are, the fact that they know all about you means that your privacy has been infringed. Right? And therefore, when people uh, say that they're upset about the uh, form system and so forth, what they're talking about is the fact that they feel that this infringes their privacy, it infringes their notion who, of who they are. And though the form system is absolutely brilliant on the data protection side, I, and you can't fault it on data protection. Nothing I said on that legal page has anything to do with data protection. I really feel it does infringe privacy, and that's why people don't like it. And the analogy I've been using all the way through, which I thought of on the, the first afternoon when I heard about the form system, is it sounded to me just like the post office opening all of your letters before they put them through your front door, just so that, that they can arrange that you get a better class of junk mail through your door. So let's talk about a different society which has different views of what is always not private, which is China. Now the Chinese firewall uh, and the Chinese internet is surrounded uh, and connections to the outside world, and in fact quite a lot of connections within China as well, go through a very large number of firewalls which are designed to stop the citizens of China from seeing things which the government doesn't want them to see. 
like, for example, an account of what happened in Tiananmen Square in 1989, or, uh, or uh, obtaining information about the, the uh, Falun Gong. They're particularly upset about the Falun Gong, which is why we go and make a point of using it in all of our examples. The main thing the Chinese firewall d does is it just says, this IP address is the BBC uh, website all about events in China in 1989. It's blocked. So you just can't get to that IP address. This is the Voice of America. You can't go there. Uh, this is the Falun Gong home, uh, home website. You can't go there. So lots of it is just done on straightforward IP blocking. But as a backup to this, they also have some keywords for spotting stuff. They snoop on the traffic. I, that's why I'm talking about it, because it's all snooping. They snoop on the traffic. They look for particular keywords going past, like Fallon. Uh, and if they see that, they shut down the connection, uh, which you know slows people down if they want to find out about the Fallon Gong. Uh, so the wonderful thing about this is that the way in which they shut down the connection is they don't actually throw away any packets they send TCP reset packets to both ends, and each end concludes that the other end has shut down the connection, and therefore they shut down the connection, and so the connection shuts down, so it works really well. Quite a lot of corporate firewalls work this way as well. Uh, because a lot of the processing tends to take place offline, you can't necessarily throw away the packets immediately, and you don't want to buffer the packets, right? so what you do is you let the stream carry on. Meanwhile, you say, oh my goodness me, this stream which is going on uh, is wicked, I will start sending resets, and you start sending resets to it. Uh, uh, one of the things I pointed out uh, in uh, 2005 was that if you ignore these resets, you can carry on looking at your pages about the Falun Gong perfectly happily. Or you can carry on uh, looking at Facebook or uh, Playboy.com or whatever else your corporate firewall is upset about and is trying to block. Just throw away the reset packets. You have to throw them away at both ends. But this is what a real conversation through the Chinese firewall looks like. You basically get the standard three-way handshake, sin, sin, ak, ak. Then off we go. In fact, we're doing it into China rather than out again. Uh, it, the, whole, the whole thing is symmetrical in terms of how the firewall works. Uh, and we did it this way because though we got a little bit of cooperation from a guy in China who helped us out, uh, we really didn't want to get him in, into any trouble. Uh, and therefore, he didn't actually know quite what we were going to do. We just said, could you please set up a little web server for us? Uh, and we're just going to send a few packets to it. And we didn't actually tell him that we were going to show the Chinese firewall didn't work. Uh, so we go off and do a get. And here you see lots of resets, hammered with lots of resets. Uh, but in fact, here's the response, because they haven't actually shut it down. There's a response. And in fact, if we carried on uh, ignoring those resets and throwing them away, we could just view the web page, which was a bit of a surprise. It's made me very famous in China, and there's lots and lots of copies of my paper being translated into Chinese and so forth. Uh, so, how oh, kind of cute. Well, the success of the Chinese in blocking things has uh, an equivalent in the West, which is that the rights holders, which is the smart name for Hollywood, music industry, people like that, people who own intellectual property, uh, and uh, people who publish the latest uh, Britney Spears single, that sort of thing, they're very concerned about the latest Britney Spears single being shared by people who haven't actually paid for it. Uh, and they believe that if people couldn't get it free, that they'd pay money for it. Strange but true. Therefore, what the music industry have been doing is they've been joining in these file sharing networks, making a list of all the people who offer them a copy of uh, the latest Britney Spears single without paying for it, writing down all their IP addresses, and nipping off to the ISP, finding out who these people are, and sending them threatening letters saying, see you in court. Uh, and this doesn't work very well, partly because it's rather expensive to do it the way they do it, uh, and partly because, uh, by some estimates, there's some 7 million people doing fire sharing in the UK, and it's going to take quite a long time to go to the courts for all 7 million of them. Meantime, so, so they would like to see ISP is helping out, spotting file sharing, uh, and blocking it rather like the Chinese do, or perhaps a little bit more effectively. It's you know, something better than just sending resets. Meanwhile, the ISPs are deeply concerned about file sharing because it's quite a lot of internet traffic. By some accounts, it's anywhere between 30 and 80% of all internet traffic. In my view, it's almost certainly consistently about 80%, and the people who think it's 30% are just missing categorizing most of it. Uh, and we'll see why they might have difficulty categorizing it in a, in a minute. Now, of course, if you have a, 
our, our proper ISP with, with lots of you know, solid business customers and the sort of people in this room. I'm sure none of you do any file sharing whatsoever, uh, and therefore all of your traffic would be 100% good stuff, and you would be 0% file sharing. It wouldn't be at all surprising to find that we couldn't actually spot you file sharing at all. So the, but since the ISPs actually control the networks, uh, then they're actually in a position to do something about it, and they have been doing something about it. Uh, so they've been doing two things, one of which is traffic shaping, which is a fancy name for slowing everything down. Uh, they basically, uh, either they drop packets at random so that the TCP just slows down because it thinks there's congestion, or alternatively they put things in queues so it just takes rather longer for the packets to get to the other end that you might expect. Oh, and sometimes they do some straightforward traffic blocking, but it's mainly traffic shaping uh, because if you block things then people ring up your helpline and say this doesn't work. Uh, and that's inconvenient because it costs you money to talk to your customers, whereas if you just slow things down, they tend not to ring up and complain so much. Now, once upon a time, you could tell what traffic was by looking at the TCP port number. You know, port 25 is email, port 80 is HTTP, port 53 is DNS, port 6699 is Napster, right? Good old days. Uh, and unfortunately, everybody's been deploying firewalls over the last 10 years or so. And the one thing about firewalls is that all firewalls let port anything on port 80 and anything on port 53 go straight through, because otherwise the internet doesn't work, because of course the internet is the web. Uh, so all sorts of other protocols have migrated onto ports 53 and 80, so you can no longer tell what anything is by looking at the port number. And of course, since ISPs have been blocking and traffic shaping uh, things like Napster and all the other variants of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing systems uh, for many years, or those peer-to-peer uh, -peer systems have evolved into not use constant port numbers so they can't be blocked by first-generation blocking systems or by not so much specialist systems but just straightforward firewall rules which just says if it's on 6699, block it. So it's 150 years since Darwin wrote his uh, is thing spending about natural selection, and believe me, Darwin was right. If you have pressure in the environment, things evolve, right? And, and traffic shaping of peer-to-peer -peer has caused peer-to-peer -peer, uh, protocols to evolve very rapidly over the last few years. So ISP has now started deploying deep packet inspection kit, exactly the layer seven switch sort of stuff which uh, Form is using, uh, exactly the sort of stuff which the Chinese government are using. Uh, and what they're doing is they're looking for the telltale signs of peer-to-peer -peer protocols. And I've got a couple of strings up there uh, taken off a, uh, a simple-minded product, which is basically looking for uh, the string BitTorrent, uh, or the second one is a, a particular binary string, which is indicative of LimeWire's implementation of Nutella. So as soon as this generation of blocking or traffic shaping uh, equipment was rolled out, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer protocols evolved again, and the main way in which they evolved was they started to use encryption. Uh, however, the people doing it were not really first-class men, I would say, in the sort of the way in which Cambridge people look down on people who haven't quite got it right. They're not first-class people. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, they've left a number of their handshakes right at the beginning for compatibility reasons. They still say BigTorrent at the moment, and they go all encrypted. So if you're looking really quickly at the right at the beginning, you can actually tell, still tell what's going on. Uh, and that's why there's this huge variation in abilities between uh, various manufacturers' uh, uh, traffic shaping uh, stuff and various manufacturers' measurement of peer-to-peer -peer traffic, because some of them understand that you can still spot it and some of them don't. Some of them get confused uh, by the encryption and just say, well, I don't know what that big flow is, but it's just gone by. The next generation of peer-to-peer traffic shaping stuff relies on various heuristics as to what is peer-to-peer. -peer. In particular, peer-to-peer -peer has some fairly distinctive patterns. You tend to see quite a lot of connections to remote hosts. Uh, you tend to see distinctive patterns of traffic going both in and out. Uh, and therefore, if you're an ISP, and what you're trying to do is to reduce the amount of uh, bandwidth usage for particular times of the day uh, in order to discourage file sharing in the middle of the afternoon or middle of the evening, depending when your peak is, uh, then this sort of heuristic works just fine because it may hit a few other things as well, but nobody ever complains because they don't understand it. Uh, but unfortunately, this is now completely useless for the rights holders 
because all we're now spotting is file sharing. We no longer have any idea what files are being shared. Right, and the standard examples, which everybody trots out, so I should do so as well, of file sharing uh, technology which is lawful is World of Warcraft patches, because World of Warcraft can't be bothered to, to build themselves a big enough server to allow 11 million people to patch their system all in the same evening, uh, and therefore they distribute, they use peer-to-peer uh, -peer technology to actually distribute their patches out to their, their users, uh, and uh, also uh, a number of Linux distros uh, use uh, again, can't afford the servers, and therefore they use uh, BitTorrent or whatever in order to distribute their installs uh, so that people get hold of the, the Linux source, the, the Linux binaries. So, if you go back a few years, the music industry were getting really excited about a new technology called Audible Magic, uh, which, is, which basically understood peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocols. It picked, used DPI, it picked up art, uh, the flow of packets going past, and it actually understood the peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocol sufficiently to be able to pick out the content which was being shifted backwards and forwards. It would then take that content and it would then say, ah, oh, this is an MP3, and it would just play it to itself. And it would do the, you know, the equivalent of, I'll name that tune in 10. Right? They'd listen to the little notes, it would do some all sorts of fancy signal processing, and it would work out that this was Britney Spears. Or, uh, you know, this was a particular recording of Britney Spears. This is the live recording, because it would actually tell the part whether or not it was the live recording or the, or the, or the studio one and so forth. And it would be able to categorize it and it look it up in a database. It would be able to say, aha, it, uh, this, this is copyright and, and we won't, we're not having this. We'll block it. Or alternatively, it would say, ah, this is the copy of Britney Spears' Sing the Live, which the uh, record company is making available as a special taster because nobody will like Britney Spears unless uh, they hear her singing first. So we, this is the taster version, so that's all right, we'll let it go through. So all sorts of fancy business models were swimming before their eyes, uh, and the ISP started doing the, the traffic shaping, everything went encrypted, and you can no longer see what's going on. So Audible Magic is a sort of, uh, you know, if you thought form shares were not very well, right, you probably don't want to be investing a lot in Audible Magic just at the moment, in my view. And basically, we've still got a handful of uh, legal cases floating around in Belgium. Uh, the court there actually told an ISP they had to fit Audible Magic, uh, which is a shame because it didn't actually work, uh, because it didn't actually understand MPLS, uh, and uh, therefore it wouldn't actually run in a real ISP environment. And they're currently going back to the court at the moment trying to sort out whether or not the court is going to change its mind and whether or not it really did tell them to fix it, just fix it, or whether or not they told them to run Audible Magic. And I was involved in the case in Ireland, uh, which started off with the record companies saying, you must fit Audible Magic. By the time we got actually got to the hearing, it was pretty clear that this was a really silly thing to ask for. Uh, and in practice, Aircom, the ISP involved, settled out of court uh, with the uh, record companies and therefore didn't even progress all the way through the court case. So I'll change topic again talk about the Internet Watch Foundation. Now the Internet Watch Foundation has been around since 1996 where there was a big moral panic uh, about child pornography pictures turning up on Usenet and something must be done. Uh, unfortunately the something that must be done was to set up a hotline so that all of these pictures could be reported uh, and then the Internet Watch Foundation would then distribute uh, notices about uh, all of these uh, uh, illegal pictures uh, to all the people running Usenet news servers in the UK and they'd remove the uh, individual articles from Usenet uh, and everybody would be happy. Back in 1996 we did actually call it child pornography uh, or kiddie porn or whatever. Uh, the IWF has uh, run a uh, fairly effective campaign because it certainly worked on me uh, which is you'll find that I uh, originally wanted us to call them child abuse images and these days child sexual abuse images uh, and that's the term I shall be using henceforward. So I'm sorry it's a bit of a mouthful, but I've been conditioned into this is the correct way of saying it, so I don't trivialise the problem, because it really is a problem. The IWF is a UK hotline. Uh, there are a number of other hotlines which have been set up on the IWF model in other countries, in about 35 countries in total, and there's an international association of hotlines called InHope. Uh, in practice, uh, nobody cares about using that anymore, nobody uses it. Uh, there's still an awful lot of material on there, but nobody uses it, so nobody notices it anymore. Uh, and all of the, uh, the moral panic and all of the uh, concern uh, which, and all the reports going to the IWF are all to do with the web. 
Uh, and the IWF have been dealing with websites as the bulk of what they've been doing for many years now. Uh, and initially they started, they discovered the same things kept on report, being reported to them again and again. So they started building a database in order to keep track of the sites which they already looked at and which, which ones they already knew about. Uh, and that database has evolved to become the basis of a blocking system uh, which is currently deployed in the UK for about 95% of the population. How does one block access? This is a quick list of uh, how not to do it, uh, which is you can use DNS poisoning. You can arrange that www.lolita.cn doesn't resolve. It resolves to 127001 uh, and a result for which you can't visit it. This works very well for lolita.cn. It works really badly for geocities.com because there's two and a half million websites there. You can black hole the, the route so that no packets will go backwards and forwards uh, to the uh, to uh, lolita.cn. Uh, that's there are limitations to that, which is if you're going to block really serious numbers of sites o over about 10,000 or so, the routers probably can't actually cope with that many black holes. Uh, and it also, uh, this system also overblocks because though you may happily block www.lolita.cn, you may find that hosted on the same web server uh, is the Romanian tourist board. Uh, and it's obviously undesirable to block the Romanian tourist board, so you're overblocking again. Uh, and also, if you get modern systems such as the uh, the guys who are doing who are doing phishing these days, fake bank websites, uh, what they tend to do is to put uh, websites up on botnets, as a result of which the IP address on which uh, the website appears to be changes every 20 minutes. It's really quite difficult to keep up with that. And the other way of doing it is to use is to stick a web proxy between the customers and the internet so that all of their traffic goes through the web proxy. You can then look at every single URL, which means you can do really precise blocking because you can block just the images and leave all the text alone. You can block particular websites. You can <coughs> do all sorts of fancy things like that. Unfortunately, that's really expensive uh, because you have to have a proxy which is capable of handling all of your customers' uh, traffic. And though that was a good idea in 1997, uh, it's no longer a terribly good idea because the customers are moving a lot more data around. And in 1997, you could actually justify this because bandwidth was really expensive and proxies were relatively cheap. So you actually reduce the amount of traffic going in and out of your ISP. Uh, these days, proxies are really expensive and bandwidth is really, really cheap. So it makes no economic sense to have a proxy at all. And then uh, those nice chaps at BT came up with a system called CleanFeed which was basically a hybrid system, uh, which they thought was going to solve the problem altogether. So basically, the design of CleanFeed works this way. You have the internet, with the cloud as usual, and you have BT's network, and you split, and you have all of BT's customers sitting down there looking at the web. And in the middle of BT's network, which means, and this is part of the design, so you can only do it if you have the right sort of network design, uh, then you actually build a little barrier and you arrange that all of the traffic goes through that little barrier. And that little barrier is basically a, a set of routers which are, ra which are dealing with the traffic coming from the customers. And it's basically the edge of the BT customer network as opposed to BT's worldwide network. And at that barrier, you arrange that all of the traffic to good sites goes straight out to the internet and all of the traffic to sites which you are concerned about, gets routed to a proxy machine. So basically what you do is you arrange that the, the IP addresses for the IP address for www.lolita.cn, right, that IP address you tell the routers about and say all of the traffic for www.lolita.cn is to go to the proxy. The proxy then looks at the URLs and, the, and decides whether or not this is lolita.cn, in which case it must be blocked, or whether or not it's the Romanian tourist board, at which point it can be allowed to go out to the internet in a normal manner. So what you've done is you've, you're using a proxy solution with all of the advantages that gives you, but you're only putting a small percentage of your traffic through the proxy. So it's a great engineering design, and so forth. So basically, that's what I've just told you. Now, of course, it doesn't actually work terribly well if, uh, in terms of stopping anybody who wants to look at this stuff from looking at it uh, because it's really easy to avoid. You can use an external proxy. You can use something like Tor. 
you can use HTTPS, at which point it's all encrypted and they have no idea what's going on, or you can use anything which isn't on port 80 because this system only looks at port 80. <coughs> uh, and so they were kind of happy with it because they argued that, well, it didn't do any harm and it might do a little bit of good uh, and people wouldn't come across child sexual abuse images by accident because, of course, as you know, if you go to dinner parties, a continued top, continual topic of conversation <coughs> is how you came across a child sexual abuse image website by accident. Now, I've never understood this notion that people came across this stuff by accident. But anyway, <coughs> uh, they were very happy with it. And so I pointed out that it had a little problem. And the little problem is that we can tell what's on the list. Because you'll be surprised to learn they don't publish the list of all of the child sexual abuse image websites in the world because some people would like to visit them <coughs> and they don't want to encourage it. So they don't publish the list, but you can reverse engineer the list because what you do is you send out a packet, but not just any old packet, you arrange that it has a really small hop count, like say about eight. So if it gets read if it's for a good site, then it'll start travelling off towards the rest of the internet, it'll get eight hops through eight routers, and the TTL will expire, and you'll get back an ICMP message saying hop count expired. Meanwhile, if you happen to pick an IP address where there is a wicked website, it will go to the proxy, which is within eight hops and therefore you'll get a message back from the proxy. So if you send out a SIM packet, you'll get a SYNAC back. So by looking to see whether or not you get back an ICMP packet or a SYNAC packet, you can tell which set of IP addresses are currently being redirected. And it works. This is, this is a real bit of Russian address space, which is so real I've, I've had to obscure bits of it. Um, uh, and the stuff isn't there anymore. This was in fact part of, uh, part of the Russian business network um, web space, the IP address space that happened. And you can see that some of these come back with ICMPs, and a couple of them come back with Synax. Now, all that actually does is it tells you the IP address. But there are directories out there which allow you to do reverse lookup of IP addresses, and it will tell you which web services are hosted on those particular uh, IP addresses, because a lot of the people who uh, look after domain names and so forth will actually tell you what, uh, the list of uh, who else is on your IP address, that sort of thing. So if you look this up, uh, then the dot forty turned out to be Lolita Portal dot whatever, which would be a really useful thing to know if you're interested in this sort of stuff because this is, you know, there's no truth in advertising on these sites, right? Just because it says that it has underage girls on it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it does, right? Whereas here with this method you get IWF approval telling you that this really is a genuine site and you can spend your money happily. It might be run by the FBI, of course, but that's another matter. Uh, and the dot .42, there was no website recorded in the database, but almost certainly because this database didn't have any dot .ru domains in it. Uh, so, and the interesting thing about this Oracle attack is that it's pretty much impossible to fix. You can detect it's going on by spotting the fact that somebody is sending out thousands of SIM packets a second right, uh, to a range of IP addresses, which you might want to spot anyway because you think they're doing a DOS attack or something like that. Um, but it works. And it, what's more, in, when I actually published this paper, uh, then I got an email from a completely different ISP who said, actually, Richard, your attack works against our system as well. And I didn't even know if their system existed. And they didn't use uh, the routers. They used a, a fancy uh, a web, uh, web redirection protocol uh, rather, than, uh, rather than the internal BGP stuff, which BT used. And my system broke theirs as well. They fixed it, they claimed, because what they did is they said, it's all right, we fixed it, because if we see any packets coming past with a hop count of, of only eight, we throw them away regardless. So I had to explain to them that we could actually do the attack a different way by just making some difference. So you could just tell the difference between uh, machines in, uh, uh, in Russia which were responding normally and their proxy system. And it's really very difficult to make one thing look like another. Now, the people in Whitehall really didn't understand this at all. Um, as far as they were concerned, blocking was impossible until uh, clean feet came along, at which point it was magically possible because of those really clever engineers at BT. Uh, so the minister stood up and told Parliament, 
Uh, recently, it has become technically feasible for ISPs to block home users' access to websites, irrespective of where in the world they are hosted. Uh, in my view, I really don't think the people in Whitehall, and certainly not the Minister, understood the cost, how fragile these systems are, how easy they are to evade, uh, and to this day, I'm not really sure they understand that previous slide and the fact that you can reverse engineer the list out of these systems. Uh, so ministers decided that all consumer broadband suppliers were to fit systems like, well, with, which either were clean feed or worked like clean feed by the end of 2007, or else they would review their options. Well, currently, I, uh, ISPA, the ISP Association, claim we're up to about 95% of all UK ISPs are blocking. That's 95% by number of end users, by the way, not by number of ISPs, because it's all the small ones who aren't, because these systems are not cheap. And it's not at all clear, even for the biggest ISPs, whether or not they're actually filtering it for all of their customers on all of their different networks. Uh, so these counts are a little bit dubious. But almost all of the UK filtering is based on proxies, one way or another. But, but how you select the stuff which goes into the proxy is either done by DNS poisoning, but instead of arranging for the DNS to resolve to 127001, you arrange it to re uh, resolve to the address of the proxy. Or alternatively, they're using uh, one of these routing protocols to dump all of the traffic onto that, or they're using one of these fancy uh, Cisco-based uh, DPI systems. <coughs> which brings us to Wikipedia, which is when most of the country discovered that we had a censorship system operating in the UK. Uh, some member of the public wandering around the Wikipedia site, came across a, an album cover from the 1970s for an obscure German band. Well, should I say obscure German band? I gather they actually played the concert at the fall of the Berlin Wall. So I probably watched them on the telly, so they're not all that obscure. Called the Scorpions. Uh, and they produced a, an album called Virgin Killer and put on the cover a picture of a, a young lady of aged about 13 who was wearing no clothes. Uh, posed in a in what the IWF believes, and I think everybody agrees, is an indecent manner, which makes it an illegal image to possess in the UK. Uh, and so the IWF added the URL to their block list and rolled it out on a Friday lunchtime. Never roll out things on Friday lunchtime, but there you go. And as a result of which, large numbers, or in fact 95%, I suppose, of UK accesses to Wikipedia we're now going through proxies, at which point Wikipedia's security model broke because the way Wikipedia deals with people who are naughty and edit Wikipedia pages and put rude words on them or turn them into adverts or claim that George Bush is dead or uh, shot President Kennedy or, or all the other sort of random band or that um, this is the best place to buy, buy Viagra, or all the other random vandalism that goes on on Wikipedia pages, when they spot some vandalism, they block that IP address. So within minutes, they managed to block these six, IP, six or seven IP addresses, which were now carrying almost all of their traffic from the UK, as a result of which nobody in the UK could edit Wikipedia anymore, unless they had a personal login. And most people who edit Wikipedia don't have personal logins. And what's more, you couldn't get a personal login, right? because if you were on the banned list, it was too late to get a personal login, because you were now banned. Wikipedia rapidly worked out what was going on, uh, within about two hours, they understood the mechanism. And what's more, they'd worked out which image it was which was being blocked. Uh, you could argue that's because they had a guilty conscience about it, because, uh, in fact, uh, they'd had a big debate way back in May 2008 as to whether or not uh, this image should be on the site at all. And the consensus had been that, yes, it was a published album cover. It wasn't very tasteful, but it was it, it's what had been shipped, and they were an encyclopedia, and they were telling you what, was, what had been shipped. At which point, everybody went and found all the other copies of this. Wonderful thing, Google Image Search. You can find all the other copies of it scattered all over the web, including one on Amazon US. Not on Amazon Co. UK. Not because they disapproved of the cover, but because the cover which is mainly sold in the UK has, a, has an alternative cover on it, uh, and Amazon Co. UK was being very proper in showing you what you'd actually get if you bought this album off them. So they showed you the correct cover. Uh, though, in fact, you could get the other one on import, because at least one... Um, reporter from Channel 4 ch yeah, from Channel Four went down to HMV and actually bought a copy of this illegal image and then held it up on Channel 4 News. 
uh, and Channel 4 News got cold feet and blurred it out. Uh, and somebody eventually told the reporter that they just committed a criminal act. And apparently they were very worried all afternoon. <laughs> anyway, on the Monday, this was all over the weekend, on the Monday, the IWF considered an appeal from Wikipedia, and their appeal process involved ringing up the police and saying, do you think this is an illegal image? And they said, yes, it is. It's indecent. And the child is clearly under, six, under 18, as a result of which the appeal failed. So on the Tuesday, the IWF board, IWF board met, by telephone, I understand, and they decided that um, since uh, they were now a main item on the news in many bulletins and so forth, and there were lots of reporters running around filming and so forth, that this was all really counterproductive, and they decided to remove the URL from the list on the basis that um, uh, more people were looking, it was now one of the most popular pages on Wikipedia, and that since their aim was to reduce the spread of this material, uh, encouraging people to look at it was really counterproductive. So they removed the URL from the list and said that they were not going to list it for anywhere else in the world. Uh, but if you put it up in the UK, then the police will come around and have a discussion with you. So you've been warned. Interestingly, uh, though they removed it from their list on the Tuesday, uh, in practice, uh, the, the uh, Wikipedia was having effects for uh, eight to ten days thereafter, uh, as various other people copied the IWF list into their products, uh, and various uh, corporate firewalls and that sort of thing were unable to visit Wikipedia. Interestingly, though they had this very wonderful proxy system, and they knew everybody had proxy systems so they could actually block individual images and not the text, uh, the, the, uh, the clever guys at IWF actually blocked the main page including all the HTML, uh, all of the text about the scorpions and so forth, not just the image. They also blocked the image description page, which even though it ends in a .jpg, is in fact a text page. That's the way Wikipedia does things. Um, so they blocked quite large chunks of text, which is not what they say they're going to do. They say they're just going to block the images. They didn't actually manage to block the versions with uh, capital Bs and capital Ks because right, they didn't know about those. And as it happens, the um, Wikipedia is agnostic about the first character there, the V. It doesn't care whether or not that's upper or lower case. It's the same, it's the same thing. But in order to make the thing look pretty, they actually had two pages, one of which with a capital K and one with a lowercase K. Right, and depending how you search for this page would depend whether or not you got the one which was blocked or the one which wasn't blocked. And of course, depending on which ISP you're on, uh, the, uh, in some cases, uh, it's certainly alleged that BT didn't actually roll out the blocking and didn't actually block it on the, Monday, on the Friday, only blocked it on Monday. As a result of which, over the weekend, there was complete confusion as to who was blocking what. Because people were saying, oh, it's blocked, and other people were saying, no, it's not, right, depending on what they were actually looking at. So there's real confusion. Uh, don't listen to consumers. They have no idea what's going on. Yeah, so all a bit of a mess. So one of the bits of work coming out of this, which, uh, which I've been looking at, uh, this summer, is trying to work out what the IWF is currently blocking. Uh, and uh, basically I'm doing this a different way, because as an academic you have to do things different ways, because otherwise it's, you can't get a paper out of it, because it is a novel, and nobody will publish it. And essentially, I have a really, really fantastic algorithm for finding out what the IWF is blocking. I say for all possible host names, I try and resolve it at one of these pieces which are using DNS poisoning, and see whether or not the resolved version of the hostname is the cache IP address, at which point I know that that particular hostname is blocked. So where do you get a list of all hostnames on the internet from? Well, it turns out there's a mob in California who actually have a database of all hostnames on the internet, which they're collecting by sniffing. Ah, snooping again. And they're sniffing all of the DNS answers which go past them. They're then throwing away who the answers were going to and reverse engineering the DNS tree and putting it into a database. Now basically their database looks like about 120 million different host names. By the time you realize that 40 million of them are um, to do with spam prevention uh, and about 10 million of them belong to Facebook, because Facebook does some very wonderful things with, host, with what are apparently host names, uh, then you end up with about 70 million hosts to check. Uh, so it's four in list of, and that list of is 70 million long, uh, and this takes about two days and eats up 22 gigabytes of your traffic uh, on your standard home ADSL. <laughs> uh, fortunately, I don't do it every day, and therefore my ISP has not yet complained to me. Uh, it doesn't actually identify the URLs, let's be clear about this. It only identifies the host names. So it will identify www.lita.cn, but if it isn't something like that, then 
uh, it won't actually identify which part of the site is actually being blocked. I said that it's really against policy to show people what's being blocked, but here is the list. Uh, it in fact dates from uh, July, this particular list, but, but basically I happen to know, because a mole told me, the IWF list is currently about 450 different URLs. I have 40% of them, I have no idea what they are because they don't seem to be in my list of host names. I'm not unclear whether or not that means they're very obscure or whether or not there's some other effect, which something I've got wrong, which I haven't worked out yet. From about 35% of the total are, are clearly wicked. Right, they're www.lilisa.cn or some variant of that. It, it's moderately clear that they're meant to be a wicked website. I have not looked at any of these websites because to look at these websites is a criminal offence uh, and some kind of some of the academic magic of this is that I'm managing to research this area without committing criminal offences. So I want to stress the fact I haven't looked at these sites, but it is clear from other inference that I can do on them that they're intentionally wicked websites. But 25% of the list, that's over 100 of those URLs, are in fact legitimate free host sites, right? things like rapidshare.com or whatever, where anybody can host stuff. Right? There are free web hosting sites in various parts of the world. Uh, and basically, uh, the interesting thing about those is that they have no interest whatsoever in keeping this material up. In fact, they'd like, rather like to get it removed. As soon as you talk to them, they'll remove it. Right? The 35%, www.theleta.cn, you talk to the people running that and say, you're hosting child pornography, and they'll say, yes, we know. Right? Or they won't answer the phone. Right? Rapidshare.com will answer the phone and remove the stuff right? because they don't want it, because they're a legitimate company. So this is quite an important public policy issue because I study bank phishing websites. And I'm here to tell you that your average fake bank website, fake version of the Barclays website, is down in four hours, provided that Barclays knows about it. If Barclays doesn't know about it, it stays up for about 10 days. Uh, because nobody tells Barclays, and so they don't remove it. Um, we're a little puzzled why it ever comes down at all, but uh, it stays up for about 10 days. Uh, if uh, the website is done by the really best technically competent people out there, using fast flux systems on botnets and so forth, it stays up for about two days. So it takes about two days to get the, uh, to get the host name removed from the DNS. Part-time volunteers remove uh, scam websites, sort of, uh, fake escrow sites, um, um, money mill recruitment sites, that sort of thing, completely fake websites, uh, in about one to seven days, depending. Your average child sexual abuse image website stays up for four weeks. The only thing we can find that comes down slower on the internet is fake pharmacy sites, and we don't think anybody is trying to remove fake pharmacy sites. We were absolutely amazed when we discovered this because, in fact, we'd originally looked at this data because we thought the removal of child sexual abuse image websites would be a gold standard which we could measure the bank's performance against. It turns out to be remarkably worse. Now, what's actually going on is that the IWF, though in the UK they'll tell an ISP that they're hosting this stuff, if it's hosted abroad, they don't actually tell anybody. What they do is they tell the police who feed it through Interpol and send faxes and, and that sort of thing and eventually some local policeman gets around to it. Or alternatively, they talk to the in-hope member in that particular country and many of the in-hope members don't feel that they can, don't have the relationship with their local ISPs to actually ring them up and tell them they're hosting stuff. So nothing happens to that report. In the US, which hosts uh, anything from 50 to 70 percent of all of this stuff, uh, they actually, in Hope member is a mob called the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and their policy certainly was when, for the, the period we looked at this data, uh, what they did is they looked up which ISP was hosting this stuff, and then they looked up to see whether or not that ISP was a member. And if they were a member, they told them. If they weren't a member, they threw the report away because that would encourage people to become members. So basically, there's real confusion. Uh, here as to whether or not something should be done and who should do it and whether or not the aim here is to remove the stuff or catch criminals. Last section is on some other sorts of snooping, which is the interception modernization program. Uh, the, the spooks, the GCHQs, the uh, MI5s, MI6s of this world would love to get their hands on lots and lots of traffic data. 
because although content is interception and is very strictly controlled under the UK system, uh, traffic data is available on self-authorization to pretty much anybody who wants it uh, and can show a reasonable need for it. Uh, and it's almost as valuable as content because if you know who's talking to who, you can often work out what they must have been saying. You know, if you know they're a drug dealer and you can see who they're talking to, you don't actually have to listen to every conversation, which is probably in some terrible backstreet slang or in Ukrainian or something which you won't understand. So listening to the content is often nothing like as valuable as getting the <coughs> traffic data to find out who's talking to who. So they came up with this brilliant idea, which is what they'd use is they'd use all this deep packet inspection equipment, the sort of stuff Form is doing, the sort of stuff the Chinese government is doing and so forth, in order to snoop on all of UK citizens. So finally, back in 1998, when I first started working with policemen and trying to explain to policemen about how the internet worked uh, and what sort of sensible questions they could ask ISPs and so forth, the classic dumb question we came up with, which we didn't want policemen asking, was, I've just found this IP address in a, a web log. Please can you tell me their Hotmail address? Right, which, of course, an ISP can't answer because an ISP has no idea what customers are doing. They know who the customer is. They can, you can tell them where, you know, who's paying the bills for this account. What you can't tell them is what they're doing with the account or whatever. But, of course, if you run uh, deep packet inspection equipment on this, what you can do is you can spot sessions with Hotmail and you can pick apart the HTTP, HTML pages and you can pick out the name of their Hotmail account because it's somewhere on the page. You can go and find the fact that they're viewing their list of incoming email. And you're not allowed to look at the subject line because that's content, but you can look at who sent it. And you can basically get out of the HTML page traffic data, which is much the same as you might get out of an email log an email server's logs, who's writing to who, just by picking apart HTML pages. This will be traffic data. Isn't this fantastic? What's more, you know, if the wicked bad people are going on to Second Life in order to hatch their wicked conspiracies, then what we can do is we can pick apart all the Second Life traffic and work out your XYZ coordinates all the time you're on Second Life, and we can work out who you've been near. Or we can go and look at World of Warcraft and pick apart the protocol and we can use this DPI thing and we can work out who you've been chatting to. We can't see what you've been saying because that's content, but we can work out who you've been chatting to because that's traffic data. Isn't this a fantastic idea? Now, the problem with this, the problem, one of the problems is that DPI can't actually do all of those things all at the same time because you need quite a lot of silicon to do all of that. And what you're actually looking at you know, you may start off not looking at Second Life until you suddenly realize all the criminals have migrated onto Second Life, at which point you suddenly care about Second Life. So you're going to con constantly going to have to be reprogramming all of this DPI kit. So there'll be uh, lots, of little, lots of jobs for analysts out in uh, Cheltenham sitting there typing away reprogramming DPI equipment. Great. Now the ISPs were a little bit unhappy about all of this. And they were particularly unhappy with the idea that their networks were going to be full of hundreds or thousands of these little snooping boxes which were being reprogrammed the whole time for the people in Cheltenham. This didn't feel secure to them. And of course, if they were constantly being reprogrammed, then the, the spooks are very unlikely to say what's currently being monitored, because that's going to be a state secret, because if the bad guys found out, then they'd avoid using Second Life this week because it's being monitored. And so your average day-to-day -day policeman is not going to know what this system is actually capable of doing today. So they're not going to know that the data is there, so they're never going to ask for it, because they're not going to have the clearance in order to know what is being monitored. So this is a, this is a system for spooks. So even though the Home Office promoted all of this, saying how useful it would be for policing, police will not have the clearance to know anything about it. And there's another little minor difficulty with it, is that the actual cost of this is enormous. Even the Home Office said they thought it would cost £2 billion. Right? We reckon somewhere around 11 to 12 is probably close to the mark. But essentially, you're, you're duplicating, you're, you're fitting about as much a uh, kit as all the routers in the UK, and then some. Right? If you actually add up how much that's probably worth, 10 or 12 billion looks about right. And I don't know if you noticed, the government's a bit short of money at the moment. And of course, if we encrypt our traffic, you can't do any of this anyway. So anyway, the Home Office spent the summer consulting on this, because they thought this was a fantastic idea. And they're currently considering all the replies they've got most of which said, no, it isn't. And the Treasury has been saying, we don't have any money. 
so I don't think the AMP is going very far. And the uh, last, last thing I heard was that they were trying to blame it on some random rogue spooks out in Cheltenham who got carried away with themselves. So, anyway, I'll completely run out of time. Uh, so I've got no time to mention other people trying to sleep on your traffic, which is the, the man in the brows of Trojans. Go on. Well, <laughs> well, well, I know I had no time to mention these. Man in the brows of Trojans. Uh, uh, phishing is now evolving into rather than setting up fake websites and so forth, they just get they just arrange to put some malware on your machine so that when you visit your real banking website, it catches all of the keystrokes uh, and therefore it knows uh, where you've been, uh, where you're banking and what all your credentials are. Uh, we've had a series of fine scandals in, in Europe, in Greece. Uh, the somebody broke into one of Mr. Vodafone's switches. Uh, and turned on the lawful interception uh, code uh, in a very clever way, showing that they really, really knew what they were doing, uh, and managed to tap, this was just before the Greek Olympics, and they managed to tap uh, the um, mobile phone conversations of the Prime Minister and most of the Cabinet, uh, and so forth. And when they found out, uh, the first thing they did was essentially was to um, you know, reboot the machine to put it in a clean state, as a result of which all the evidence has been lost. Uh, and it is unclear whether or not that was intentional, that reboot or not. Uh, certainly one Greek manager uh, went and committed suicide, which is very sad. It's very unclear as to whether or not he felt guilty or whether or not he just felt pressured by the fact there were a lot of people running around being very, very upset about this. In Holland, uh, Holland deployed some uh, lawful interception equipment uh, which came from, uh, from Israel, and they deployed that because it was cheap. Uh, and uh, they used it for doing lots and lots of wiretapping uh, and after a little while they discovered that the Israelis were also use, able to use it for wiretapping. Uh, and this is currently quite a big issue which uh, is certainly getting the Indians very excited and uh, BT recently making statements to the effect that they're not getting excited about this, honest, because um, they're very calm and collected people. Uh, how do we know all these phone exchanges we're buying from China right, aren't uh, relaying every conversation in the UK to, uh, to Beijing. Uh, this is a relevant sort of question to ask because in the first Gulf War, uh, one of the first things that we did was to bomb all the telephone exchanges in Baghdad. Uh, and then they got replaced by modern, up-to-date, computerized telephone exchanges. In the second Gulf War, we bombed the telephone exchanges very, very late indeed in the war. Why was that? Um, who else is going to be bugging you while well, your partner? Right, there's a great deal of interest in the internet uh, uh, when your uh, if your partner is playing away from home chances are they're using the internet real interested in snooping on that uh, and of course your employer is extremely interested in knowing whether or not you're reading Facebook in the office uh, fortunately I work in the corridor where uh, lots of us read Facebook because uh, people are doing research onto Facebook and therefore we have a really good excuse um, and alternatively are you planning your holiday or just doing your, your shopping uh, on the uh, employer's time and therefore are very interested in stooping on that sort of thing uh, uh, or indeed the really uh, traditional thing as to whether or not they're looking at porn, you're looking at porn. So lots and lots of stooping going on. We're trying to look at uh, much of it. Uh, just to remind you what I've covered, advertisers want to snoop on your traffic to find out what you're interested in. Uh, some nations take the view that you shouldn't be interested in particular topics such as uh, uh, your recent history. Uh, some ISPs and some ministers want to stop you accidentally coming across uh, child sexual abuse images, so thank God they've stopped that happening quite so much. Uh, and, but unfortunately, they don't seem to have found a way for actually removing this stuff from the internet in a really rapid manner. Uh, and some spooks think that knowing absolutely everything about you will make the world a safer place. Uh, and some people, and I count myself amongst them, think that privacy and proportionality in these things really does matter. So the first URL there is our, our blog at the university where we put all the cool stuff we do uh, and you'll find most of the things I've talked about, some story about them on there. Uh, and the second one is the Foundation for Information Policy Research which is an internet think tank which tries to explain all of these things to government. Thank you very much. You mentioned the distinction between content and traffic data. Now, where do long, complex sets of URL parameters that seriously describe what you're about to look at fit? Well, the distinction between content and traffic data is essentially 
uh, a hangover from people who were trying to distinguish between phone numbers and the conversation. And a lot of this stuff is done by analogy from telephones, which people kind of understood uh, and is being applied to the internet. Uh, and, and it's an important distinction because we've ended up with a situation that uh, things like who you are, your account details, where you live, if you're operating a particular account or you own a particular phone number or whatever it may be, is very straightforward for people to get hold of. Your local council can get hold of that. If they, you know, if, if they find uh, your business card underneath a whole pile of fly tipping, then they can go and ask the uh, phone company to, uh, to do a reverse directory lookup on your, on your phone number from your business card, and then they can come around and interview you about your fly tipping. And then we have, at the other end of the scale, we have content which you have to go to a, the Secretary of State, which means either the Home Secretary or the uh, Foreign Secretary if it's, if, if it's a spy you're trying to tap, or the Northern Ireland Secretary if you're doing it in Northern Ireland, or the First Minister if you're doing it in Scotland, it's all exotic. In fact, the Secretary of State is all of the senior ministers, so in fact you could go to the Prime Minister as well, he's the Secretary of State when he needs to be. But anyway, you go to the Secretary of State, you get a signature, and that's a really hard thing to do, and they only do about 2,500 of those a year. And then we've ended up with traffic data, which everybody uh, who works with the internet understands is really very, very intrusive, but it's been lumped in with reverse directory lookup as if it was equivalent to that. And therefore we've ended up with these almost no controls on this at all. To fix the problem, to actually answer your question, to fix the problem uh, in uh, 2000 when the Regulation and Investigatory Powers Act was going through, was they came up with this really long and complicated phrase about identifying the machine but not some program within the machine, right, which meant something to the parliamentary draftsman, uh, who's a lawyer, and didn't mean anything to anybody else at all. Uh, and the easiest way to think about it, or a way in which it's always explained to people, is that um, everything up to the slash at the end of the uh, host name is traffic data. Everything after the slash is content. But of course, this doesn't work very well when you have multi-homing systems. It doesn't work very well when you have load balancers. It doesn't work very well if you actually understand the technology there. Because uh, notionally, if you actually understood what uh, the remote system, what technology it was using, then you would refuse to hand over everything up to the slash on the basis this would produce more identification than you were entitled to. We have similar problems with the headers of emails in that everybody kind of agrees now that the subject line must be content, and they, but they feel that all of the received lines must in, must in some sense be, be traffic data because uh, they don't have a full appreciation of all the exotic things that you could possibly get in a received line, which might indicate um, which spam filtering program and whose settings it was which, were, which, which it was going through. So it's all very unsatisfactory. Um, it's quite possible that they're going to have another go in this area in order to tidy various things up. Uh, one part of the consultation recently has been as to who should have access to traffic data anyway because of this uh, panic about uh, another completely different part of uh, the RIP Act, which is to do with uh, surveillance and all of these councils wandering around uh, taking pictures of dog owners uh, uh, and having to get authorization and checking whether or not people were living at the address which they'd given to their school and, and so forth. So there's been a, a parallel consultation to the one I just described on IMP, which has been looking at the operation of the Act in general, and looking at what is appropriate in terms of uh, getting the right level of permissions for these things. Which is a very long answer to a very simple question, I'm sorry. Uh, Richard, um, you touched on a, a similar sort of area that uh, I wondered uh, what your views were is regarding the Iraqi telephone exchanges. Um, I hadn't read up on this in recent months, but uh, I was aware that the 21st century network that BT were installing had various phases, and of course they went out to tender for, for, for equipment, etc. And of course Chinese equipment came in quite cheap, and, and I believe that the, the uh, certain, certainly one of the three phases um, is going to utilize Chinese produced um, equipment. What are your views on the potential risks to the the UK backbone and, and, and things? Well, we've, we've considered it in, in terms of the question of which is how do you know that something you've been sold is doing what you think it's doing? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, turns out to be an extremely difficult question. Uh, the US have been addressing this question at a completely different level in that they're buying a lot of their silicon from China, right? And therefore the question arises as to whether or not the chips they're buying actually do what they're supposed to do, or whether or not they have some extra functionality built in, which um, 
could suddenly be turned on in the event of hostilities. Um, and therefore, they've got extremely interested in whether or not you can actually take a description of a chip in a high-level language like Verilog or you know, even something much higher le level than that, and then actually show that the system you've got out the end, with all of the gates and all of the little transistors scattered around, is actually a correct mapping of that, and that nothing extra has been added in on the way. Uh, and it turns out that this is a remarkably difficult problem to fix. Right? And once you start looking at the system level, way above the ship level, it is, it is essentially impossible. What you can do, of course, is you can put uh, firewalls and things around your telephone exchange so it can't communicate the data straight back to uh, Beijing, but equally, uh, I suppose what they do is they just modulate the frequencies slightly on a, on a telephone conversation which is going into China, and then they can pick it out of there. These are really, really difficult problems. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, got a PhD out of looking at these so-called side channel attacks, uh, and essentially um, you can slow them down, uh, but, they, but they exist. We're kind of used to the idea that you can fix some of these things with air gaps. And what my, co my colleague Stephen Murdoch showed was that, in fact, if you heat up computers slightly, uh, then you can arrange that, um, that their clock runs at a slightly different frequency, and you can actually detect that from the other side of the internet, as a result of which, even if you have an air gap, if you make one of the uh, sides of this air gap hot and the other one and vary its hotness, uh, then you can affect the machine which you can uh, interact with across the internet, as a result of which you can actually signal not a, not a great bandwidth. Getting the full set of drawings for the next Typhoon bomber would be a real struggle, but, but signaling out 64 bits of an encryption key is, is certainly possible if you have the patience. These are hard problems. We don't have answers. Best thing is to get on with the Chinese, <laughs> which seems a very appropriate point to stop, really. <laughs> get on with the Chinese.